Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so excited to welcome you to tonight's event with Deborah Willis, John Stocker, and Sarah Lewis discussing their book, To Make Their Own Way in the World, The Enduring Legacy of the Zeely Daguerreotypes, alongside contributor and this evening's moderator, Elisa Barbash. Tonight's event is part of our ongoing virtual event series. As we remain digital for the time being, we're so excited to continue the work of bringing authors and their writing to our community during these difficult times. Especially now, it is through the support of authors and our beloved community that we were able to make events like this happen. So thank you so much for continuing to show up. For tonight's event, we will conclude with some time for your questions. If you'd like to ask the speaker something, locate the Q&A button wherever it may live on your Zoom display, or you can submit all your questions. We'll get through as many as time allows. If you go to the chat section of this presentation, I will shortly be posting a link to our website where you can purchase your copy of To Make Their Own Way in the World. If you already have a copy of the book or would like to contribute to this series and our store in a different way, I will also be posting in the chat a link to our website's donation button. We greatly appreciate any and all support you were able to extend to us at this time. And lastly, as you may know, if you've participated in large virtual gatherings lately, technical issues might come up. We do apologize in advance for that. If any technical glitches do occur, we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. And now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Deborah Willis is a renowned photographer, curator, and is a university professor and chair of the Department of Photography and Imaging at the Tisch School of the Arts at New York University. She is the author of several books, including Reflections in Black, A History of Black Photographers, 1840 to the Present, and Envisioning Emancipation, Black Americans, and the End of Slavery. John Stauffer is the Cates Professor of English and of African and African American Studies at Harvard University. He is the author or editor of 20 books and over 100 articles, including Giants, The Parallel Lives of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, a national bestseller, and the award-winning history, Black Hearts of Men, Radical Abolitionists and the Transformation of Race. Sarah Lewis is an associate professor at Harvard University in the Department of the History of Art and Architecture and the Department of African and African American Studies. She's the founder of the Vision and Justice Project and is the author of several books, including forthcoming projects examining the work of Carrie Mae Weems and a book on race, whiteness, and photography, all from Harvard University Press. Elisa Barbash is an award-winning filmmaker and curator of visual anthropology at Harvard's Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. She is co-director of the feature films In and Out of Africa and Sweetgrass, as well as co-writer of the book Cross-Cultural Filmmaking, a handbook for making documentary and ethnographic films and video. Tonight, they will be discussing their magnificent and magisterial book, To Make Their Own Way in the World, A Powerful Resurrection of Alfred, Delia, Drana, Fasana, Jack, Jem, and Renti, eight women, men and women of African descent whose appearances were captured in 15 of the cruelest images taken in American history. In her brilliant write-up of this book, Pearl Segal of the New York Times asks the essential question, is there a correct way to regard these images throughout this book? Scholars whose work spans countless backgrounds, histories, and specialities have convened to offer new, previously unimaginable ways of viewing these images, seeing them as they have never been seen before, and unearthing the long discarded truths of the stolen lives they depict. We are so deeply honored to be hosting this event tonight. Without further ado, I will now turn things over to our esteemed panelists. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Benjamin, and thank you to the Harvard Bookstore for hosting us here. Um, we're delighted to be here to be able to share this very complicated book with you. Um, in order to make this conversation make a little bit more sense, I'm going to go through a little bit of what the book is about and what the garotypes look like so that you have an idea of what we're talking about. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. So to make their own way in the world, the enduring legacy of the Zeely daguerreotypes is an edited book with interdisciplinary contributions from 23 different authors and artists. The book concerns a set of 15 daguerreotypes of seven enslaved people. 
The photographs were made in 1850 in Columbia, South Carolina by studio photographer Joseph Seeley for Harvard scientist Louis Agassiz. Agassiz had intended to use the images to support his theory of polygenesis. He believed that rather than all humans descending from one origin, peoples of different races were of different origins, a theory of scientific racism that was discounted even in its time by some of Agassiz's Harvard colleagues. For reasons that John Stoffer will discuss today, Agassiz publicly presented the daguerreotypes only once. They were then lost to history until their rediscovery in an attic cabinet at Harvard's Peabody Museum in 1976. Since their rediscovery, the photographs have prompted intense discussion, study, and controversy. In his preface to this volume, Henry Louis Gates Jr. makes this important observation. As we've seen in so many cases around the globe, museums can come into possession of exploitative images. In this case, to me, the underlying original sin is the fact that the enslaved men and women in the Zeely Agassiz daguerreotypes were not afforded the right to give or withhold their consent to be photographed. It may have been legal to take those images at the time, but it was profoundly unethical. I think that was and remains the heart of the issue. So with this shared belief as a starting point, each author explores a different aspect of the images, beginning with the question Gates poses in the title of his foreword. Who are these people? Building on earlier research by Eleanor Reichlin and Molly Rogers, Greg Hetchimovich conducted a deep dive into archives in Columbia, South Carolina, and reveals new information about these individuals. Fasana was a carpenter born in Africa, enslaved on the plantation of Colonel Wade Hampton II. Fasana might have worked con to construct the Hampton mansion, Millwood. There is evidence in the 1870 census that after emancipation, Fasana lived alone in Richland County. Jem, and you can see his label on the upper left-hand corner, and I, I should mention that when the daguerreotypes were discovered, um, within the cases, there were labels that described the people within them. So as soon as the daguerreotypes were discovered, we knew the names of the people um, who were photographed. Jem may have been Gullah of the South Carolina coast or islands, and he was enslaved by F.W. Green, who was likely a mechanical engineer. So it's possible that Jem worked on building projects in Columbia. On the label in the case that contained Alfred's photograph, and that's the third one down on the right, Alfred is described as Fula, which may be Fulani, and quote, belonging to J. Lomas. The 1850 census rec records an English-born engineer named John Lomas, who lived near Columbia in Richland County. This Lomas was also a farmer, so Alfred might have worked as a mechanic, an artisan, or a farmer. The other individuals in these images were enslaved by Benjamin Franklin Taylor, and it's likely that they toiled at least part of the time in the cotton fields of Taylor's grub field plantation. They were Jack, who worked as a driver or a kind of overseer, from Guinea and his daughter Draina. There was Renty from Congo and his daughter Delia, who may have worked as a blacksmith. It is likely that Renty's partner was a woman called Edie, and they had at least five children, including Hector, Molly, Cesar, July, and Delia. This book explores the lives of these individuals, as well as the impact the photographs have had and continue to have on the ongoing American discussion of race and racial justice. I'd like to begin this conversation by looking at that impact, both historically and upon the individual contributors to the book. And I would like to start with Deb Willis, um, Dr. Deb. Um, <laughs> 
what when you first saw these stereotypes when you first heard of them perhaps in 1977 when they were in the news what was your initial reaction to the discovery of these images and how did, has that influenced your subsequent work in the field of photography and photographic history thank you lisa and um it's good to be here with sarah and john and all of you who are 100 people out there in the audience there around the world. Um, it was a, an impact. It was, you know, the a lot was going on in, in, in 76 based on the bicentennial. Uh, a lot of discoveries um, focusing on African American history. Um, new books were uh, written. Uh, a number of uh, people were saving families, were saving their collections. And so um, having the opportunity to discover this art, an article in the newspaper, um, I had just graduated from, uh, I was from undergraduate school and I was stunned by the article. I was fascinated with the stories because I was at the time researching a history of black photographers. Um, I was also interested in um, researching the history of um, finding collections of, of Black people uh, photographed during that time period. So that personal memory for me was uh, really embracing and it, it gave me a sense of hope to show how photography shaped um, history at that time. And so I was um, curious about the discovery. Um, I, there were, I know it was in the New York Times when I read it and the the photographs still are in uh, in my mind's eye, you know, the profile image. Um, they did not have the exposed images of, of the breast, but I remember seeing just kind of an overlap of images in, in the paper. And that's what I recall. But looking at those images, it really encouraged me to continue my research and wanted to know more about the images. And they stayed with me until uh, later on and, and later, of course, Brian Wallace's essay and there were other pieces that were written um, during that time period, but it was early on in the 70s when I first encountered the images. Wonderful. Um, John Stoffer, um, Eleanor Reichlin made the link between Agassiz and the daguerreotypes in her research uh, as a staff member of the Peabody but other questions about Agassiz's relationship to the images remained. John, you write in your essay, not suitable for public notice, Agassiz's evidence, about why Agassiz might have put these images away and why they remained hidden for all of those years. Can you tell us what you found? Yes, yeah, so it's been a major question that is one of the reasons that led me to it. Agassiz was the nation's leading scientist. He helps, um, he creates the Harvard School of Science, the Lawrence School of Science. He was, in fact, one colleague called him a shameless self-promoter. So he liked to promote himself and his evidence. And uh, he, um, after um, commissioning the daguerreotypes and bringing them back to Cambridge, uh, he held a Cambridge Scientific Club meeting where he showed them to fellow scientists and intellectuals. Uh, and uh, journalists were brought in. In fact, it was covered by the press. And the journalists, uh, uh, journalists said that it, the daguerreotypes, it, it suggested that daguerreotypes were powerful evidence. And yet Agassiz, after it's the only public, so-called public meeting in which he shows these daguerreotypes uh, to anyone outside of his very private sphere. And he puts them in a drawer. And as you point out, they disappear until 1976. And uh, so Agassiz was a, um, a huge, he was a, the major scientist, a huge self-promoter. He was in the news every week. He was constantly showing images of fish and other animals because he was seen as, to this day, as seen as inventing or discovering more species 
of fish and of other animals than anyone else. He's what Stephen Jay Gould called an extreme splitter, so that if they're the minor, the, the smallest differences, uh, he would uh, announce them a new species. Uh, and he felt that there's evidence that he felt that these daguerreotypes provided the proof of his polygenism, which is a profoundly racist view of, uh, it was interpreted in two ways, either people of African descent were either a separate species or it was they were separate origins, uh, which um, in fact, Agassiz tried to argue against divines or religious people that it didn't contradict um, the Bible because essentially Agassiz was saying that in the Bible, the, the genesis that we have is only the genesis of whites. What the Bible left out, because it can't include everyone, is the genesis for Africans, the genesis for Chinese, the genesis for all these different races. Um, and so Agassiz, um, essentially, I based on a lot of research and collaboration with colleagues, suggest that there are two main reasons why he tabled or um, did not want those uh, daguerreotypes circulating. One is that Agassiz had very close friends with a number of leading abolitionists and anti-slavery advocates. He was a close friend of Charles Sumner, who was really the, a major champion of civil rights. Sumner grew up in a black neighborhood. He was very close with a number of the black abolitionist leaders. Agassiz was close to Emerson, who by the 1850s was an abolitionist. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow hosted dinners, hosted integrated dinners where he invited African Americans to his home with whites. Uh, Fanny Longfellow, M Longfellow's wife, was even more of an abolitionist. Aza Gray, a fellow scientist, was anti slavery. But Agassiz was also friends with a lot of leading pro slavery Southerners who loved his theory of polygenism. And in fact, right after he showed um, the or had this Cambridge Scientific Club meeting, he was invited to receive a professorship at, um, in, at uh, South Carolina and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the University of, um, University of uh, South Carolina or uh, of Charleston in South Carolina. And beginning in 1851 until the Civil War, every winter and at that time, Harvard had long winter breaks. He spent a few months living in South Carolina with these wealthy pro-slavery uh, slave owning elites in South Carolina. And that relationship with Southern leaders and Northern anti-slavery leaders was important. If he's going to expose uh, the evidence, uh, he's going to lose one group of those friendships. It was also a period, it was 1850 at the same year, it was a revolutionary period of this uh, uh, delegates from nine uh, southern states convened as a, a, a secession convention and considered seceding in 1850. They decided not to, but they came close to seceding in 1850. Um, and uh, it was also a period in which in the wake of the Fugitive Slave Law, the, this, the, this Boston and Massachusetts were, uh, were deeply divided over slavery. So for Agassiz to take a position on anti-slavery. Essentially, it was a time in which you couldn't sit on the fence. You couldn't say anti-slavery, pro-slavery I'm uh, is irrelevant to me. You had to take a position. Essentially, it was a period of revolutionary fervor. It's a period not that different, in my view, from today, in which you have this extraordinary rise of um, protest movement, Black Lives Matter has been, in my view, very successful and at, um, at inspiring these almost daily or weekly protests. And so the one, one reason is that Agassiz w chose his, his, his reputation, his public status as a scholar, as a person who's always in the news North and South over uh, providing or circulating uh, disseminating the evidence that he feels is accurate. Uh, the other reason uh, that I think that he um, he tabled the daguerreotypes is that there was a profound difference between how Northerners and Southerners viewed, especially photographs of African Americans who were nude. As you pointed out, most of these photographs they are nude. Agassiz has them posed in anatomical poses. He poses them the same way he, he posed 
fish and other animals from a scientific perspective. They're nude and at that time in the US North for regardless of what your race or ethnicity was, a nude photograph was unacceptable for wide dissemination or circulation. In the South, it was actually quite common for slaves to be stripped nude at auctions uh, or to be uh, paraded uh, partially nude or nude at auction because they were seen as property. And uh, so for Agassiz to disseminate these uh, daguerreotypes of nudes as evidence of his polygenism, he would have received a huge amount of criticism. So the upshot is he does it for his personal reputation, for his emphasis on his own fame and continuing to disseminate it, realizing that making public uh, the evidence of his Cambridge Scientific Club meeting is uh, going to damage his reputation. Well, he, re he really did try to sit on the fence. Um, yeah, he really did. Yeah. Right. I mean, the very fact that he could remain friends with, I mean, two of these uh, pseudo scientists in the South became leaders of the Confederacy during the Civil War. And then he's also friends with Sumner, who's one of uh, a leading senator politician during the war. He's very close friends with uh, Lincoln and advising Lincoln in every step of the way. Yeah. So uh, that was a, a major reason. And I mean, everyone who knew him, even his close friends realized that he was um, a shameless self promoter and that that was, uh, that was very important to him. It's, he, he made an effort to be in the news every day. He was one of the nation's leading public figures. And he yeah. wanted to be known throughout the nation rather than just in one area, one community. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to a little technicality because two of the subjects of the seven subjects are completely nude. Right. Five of them are not. And right. now I want to talk to Sarah because this is very, a very important part of Sarah's work. One of the most disturbing aspects of these daguerreotypes is the enforced or forced disrobing of the people in the um, photographs. In your essay, beautifully entitled The Assist Insistent Reveal, you mention, quote, the chilling gesture of forced partial undress in the composition of Zeely's daguerreotypes. Can you expand on this? Um, in any way you wish, but I was thinking in, in the context of depictions of people of color throughout the history of Western art. In two minutes or no. Thank you, Lisa. Well, yeah. first, I just want to express my gratitude to my co-panelists uh, and to you, Lisa, and to Deb, and to John. It's really such an honor um, to be part of this profound project in which we can honor the lives of those who have had their agency stripped from them in ways that I'll describe as, as it relates to your question, Lisa, and do justice uh, to, to their lineage and legacy. Uh, the, ar the article, the chapter that I have in this book speaks to what is an unusual feature of any portrait, and it's really what elects that these objects to not be seen as portraits at all. These subjects, apart from the full frontal nudes that you described, are in a state of half dress. Their clothes have been forcibly stripped down. And what you see in the portraits of the women, and I think in the most chilling fashion, is that their clothing is bunched around their waist, right? And what that does is it really instantiates the objects as double portraits. It really gives us a sense of the violence of scientific racism, the way in which there was this forcible move to deprive agency of those subjects, of those, uh, as, as Greg Hekimovich describes them in the book, not even as slaves, but as captives, right? That use of, of clothing also did something very specific in the history of representation. In the 19th century, you start to see the that state of half dress as doing two things. First, moving um, an object from being a work that's more situated in the history of art to one that moves into the history of natural science. 
And that, that move from art to science is what you're seeing instantiated in these objects through that, that template of forcible undress. What, what I would also elect as another reason for what John here is describing as the sort of failure of these objects in the end is that that template became used in an abolitionist context to actually expose the inhumanity of slavery. So you have Private Gordon as, a, as maybe an emblematic image that the audience members might know, where you're looking at his scourged back exposed, or think of Sojourner Truth in 1858, um, on disrobing herself um, to, it, to both shame uh, white Southerners, men who had asked her if she in fact was a woman, um, but here she is inhabiting a, a template that you're seeing in the Zeely Daguerre types as well. So that position is a Janus one. And the argument in the book and is to consider how that template actually lives on in the 20th century as well, but creates out of those objects, I think, an, an extraordinary example of the weaponization of photography through compositional templates to both denigrate human life and then to honor it um, as well. So how did I do under two minutes? <laughs> no, I was kidding. <laughs> um, it was it was such a complicated question that um, I, I you know I was like talk about the history of Western art and the nude. Um, and thank you, Sarah. Um, you know, just to jump in for a second, please. I think it's really important to see, um, you know, for a young student straight out of undergraduate without the reference of this history, it's amazing now to reimagine how it's how this history, as difficult as it is today, um, in the 70s, I saw families, you know, I, I saw, you know, bodies who were enslaved and and and, and actually saw them as the evidence of labor. But also to see them was a way to connect to um, different types of debates about how, what what um, images to preserve and to, to of, of black families as well as the experiences of people who were enslaved. So it's amazing to to listen to today, like some forty years later, yeah. to see all of the ways and the complicated ways that we have been able to kind of. Um, identify ways to see these images and, and how complex this experience has been. Specifically, as, as, as Sarah mentions, um, the undressed body, the partially undressed body, the mm -hmm. fact is that the, the, the colorful um, dress skirt that we see at the bottom of some of the images and how, you know, just imagining the violence of that stripping and, and what that means. And yeah. what yeah, I'd love to add, speak to that or add to that just in this context of Please. thinking through how we are in lineage with these objects and their, their use and these families. I, I think that one of, and it might anticipate your, your question, Lisa, but one of the reasons that these objects I think are so um, gripping um, as a scholar is that they do position us um, as extensions of, of the histories there. I think I first learned about them when I walked into the Harvard Art Museums um, as, a, as a student and learned that Louis Agassiz's home constitutes the foundation of that museum, right? Which the Cambridge um, city has stated on a blue and white marker, right in the foliage when you walk in. And here, to speak to Deb's point, you know, we have decades later, Carrie Mae Weems's landmark series from here, I saw what happened and I cried on the walls to give us a sense of how it is that we can see these, these sitters as family, right? As part of the human family. So I'll speak to it more in a bit, but it's such an important point. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Carrie, um, Carrie Mae Weems's work because um, I think um, the 1995-96 work that she did from here I saw what happened and I cried in which she took photographs of Renty, Jack, Drena and um, Delia and inscribed words upon them. And she 
it, not in a negative way. She appropriated these images and made them her own and then said something new about them. And I wonder if Deb or Sarah or John, if any of you, either of you want to say anything about Carrie's early work uh, with the daguerreotypes, that, that particular piece. Well, I think it's really important to acknowledge that Carrie as an artist was interested in not necessarily, she wanted to represent a, a different story about looking at the, the experiences of black people who've been photographed as types. And how do we address um, this appearance of photography? You know, like first appearance as a type, um, you know, and then at the same time, this visual evidence of, of existing as a type. And then also having um, the scientific um, story weave, you know, woven in through this narrative that Carrie is seeing um, that was part of popular culture at the time, uh, scientific culture at the time, but then also today, as Carrie um, experienced it, um, to create that red, you know, to cr make them alive with the, the red dye that's in the image. And, and also to embolden through glass, the sense of, of, of a tombstone um, text. You know, you became a, a, a scientific um, subject. Uh, you know, those kind of way that those pieces are etched on there kind of focused on to me as, as an epitaph in terms of that way of reading these images and, and based on the size. Um, this, this allows me um, the opportunity to try to share my screen again without you seeing all of my um, garbage that's on my screen. And um, I'm going to show Carrie Mae Weems's um, four images that are part of a 30 plus essay about African American photographic stereotypes. And um, we're going to do that now. And then I will go into um, bits of Carrie Mae Weems's photo essay that she produced specifically for this book and asked Sarah to speak a little bit about it and Deb as well, because Deb's contribution, one of her many contributions to the book is an interview with Carrie, but so that we all know what you're talking about. Um, but while we're doing the, that, because I was say, yeah. How's, how's that? Great. Yeah. Okay. So um, it, it was interesting because both Sarah and I included these images in our um, essays, but in, in, in different ways. Um, so Deb, you, you pointed out that, that Carrie yeah. was using, uh, yeah, why so don't the, I let you do it? Right, yeah. So the text basically, you know, a, a photograph, you became a photographic t a subject a Negroid type in terms of that whole aspect in terms of the profile, but she's actually taking um, texts um, from different narratives that she's read through the archive and anthropological debate, you know, um, so she's, she really recognizes that people were debating um, about the existence of, of black bodies during that time. So she is, you know, creating these stories in that narrative and then that circle that she uses as, as a metaphor, as a focus for us to focus, you know, just as we focus when we go through the um, micro, you know, like microscope, you know, so she's looking in that way and, and creating this kind of narrative with that, um, with that story. But I don't know if John or uh, Sarah want to follow up on that. I think that's very good. I think that's, I love the metaphor of a microscope. It's. Um, She's exposing the um, the attempt um, to dehumanize humans by seeing them, treating them in this kind of anth these anatomical and scientific ways. It's um, in one sense the the coverage of this Cambridge Scientific Club meeting reflected, in a sense, um, what you. Um, have said and that one of the lines they said is that these images are not suitable uh, for public notice, um, that they should not be just broadcast without context. 
uh, to the world. Um, that these are um, images that are uh, that are very disturbing. Um, but I love that analysis, Deb. Mm, as do I know. I mean, we have, we have this masterful read from Deborah Wills. Of course we do, no surprise. I, um, I think what I would only just add is that, and it's actually an observation that one of my students this semester made, and it's that the black mat and the black frame, when seen, when you see this work directly after looking at the actual daguerreotypes, um, starts to become a response to that black case of the daguerreotype itself, which, you know, as those of us who've seen it know, is, is a thick object, right? These are, would have been pocket held objects in, in the 19th century. Imagine walking around with, with one of these in your pocket, right? The, the, that haptic experience of dehumanizing to that degree. One of the students, I think rightly saw the decision to create these rounded matte black frames as a response to those objects themselves, even as it relates to the framing, which I thought was an important, important additional layer onto Carrie's many masterful um, interventions here. Yeah. yeah, and I would add that the red color is, um, I think, meant to refer possibly to the red velvet that is in the cases with yes. Zealy's imprint on them. And so Carrie puts her imprint on these red objects. And I, and I see it as blood. You see it as blood. I do too. I, I do I, too. Yeah, yeah. Other, other, yeah. Yeah. But I also see that. That's why I love the metaphor of the microscope because microscope, it's a very, I mean, at that time, it was a very private viewing experience. Mm -hmm. And one individual put his or her eye into the microscope and you saw the object you were looking at. It was usually framed. Uh, and there, the light within a microscope was, um, was different than the natural light. Uh, and the red I very much see is as um, as evoking the blood. Mm -hmm. the, the... Yeah, yeah, another way to bolster the blood reading is to think about her choice of the word you, right? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. Yeah. These yeah. I and, and sticking with the red, I just not want to mention that the background behind Deb is the cover of the book, which is a work by Carrie that is Carrie Mae Weems that um, is, has been colorized by her and then splattered with, with dark marks. Um, and um, that's from, I believe an 1862 image of uh, enslaved people working in, in fields. Mm -hmm. So it was a um, theme that, that it is obviously a theme that Carrie is still interested in. If we move on to the next to the work that Carrie did for the book. Um, I think we have a few words to say about this before we have to get to questions. Um, Carrie's essay is some 30 something pages long. Um, Sarah, did you wanna talk about it? No, oh, I, I certainly can. There's so much to say. It was such an extraordinary project and book. Um, I've recently, over the past four years, with a, a graduate student in history of art and architecture, Christine Garnier, put together uh, the, the first anthology on Carrie Williams's work for MIT Press, um, the October file. And it's allowed me to think through her body of work. And I think ultimately, for the sake of time, I'll just sort of compress much of what I would say to, to this. I mean, ultimately, I think Carrie's work it, speaks to not the kind of marketplace ultimately, but the drama of history. That, that's her stage, that's the audience. And there are many reasons for that actually, I think. Uh, but ultimately I think that you know, Catherine Delmez is right when she's described Carrie Mae Weems as quote, history's ghost. I think this is a, a way to see how her muse, this kind of rookin figure of her body that she uses, at, as she does here in the Louisiana project, um, as, as a way to allow us to see the present, the past, potentially the future anew. This is ultimately, no matter the series, are largely her project to reframe our notion of what's possible through an examination, oftentimes of the past. 
And from here, I saw what happened. I cried is probably one of the most um, vivid, uh, profound, and, and chilling examples of that of that practice. Um, in the end, I think that her aesthetics are really defined as an aesthetics of reckoning, of forcing us to contend with the unspeakable. And in times, I mean, she does this through heralding those who have been forgotten, uh, unnamed. Um, and really, she does this also by marshalling the power of what Deborah Willis has so beautifully um, written about, the power of beauty, right? And to consider how we've formulated an aesthetics of power over time. So it's it's really crucial that Carrie Miriams' voice and through the interview that she conducts with Deborah Willis and her work is, is part of this, this volume. Um, Deb, so I, I was thinking of, of you encountering the daguerreotypes at all these various moments in, in, in recent history, 1976, then, um, I mean, sorry, yeah, 1976, then 1996 with Carrie's first work. Uh, from here, I saw what happened and I cried and then you really delve in deeply into Carrie's photo essay, which is Carrie, both yours and Carrie's new encounter with the, with the daguerreotypes. And, and what, what do you think that this essay says in 2020 now, although Carrie made it a few years ago, um, what does it say that, that is new that we need to pay attention to? I think what's happening now, and as we, when we think about public debates um, from the 19th century with, with Agassiz, um, we're having public debates now um, about monuments, um, about the importance of the archive or the absence of archives. And so what we're experiencing now is an opportunity to look at the record and see the multiple stories that have been um, neglected in some way, um, but also that have been um, resurfaced. But, but in a sense, she's paying homage to this to different historical narratives from um, the female body, from the experience of dress, the aspect of um, objectifying um, the, the body when we think about the, the experience of women who were enslaved and who breastfed children. Um, so we're, there, there are the multiple stories that have not been discussed. You know, John talked about uh, images that could not be shown in the North or the South based on, you know, Christian values. We also know that some of these images circulated in private bathrooms and private boudoirs because of pornography. So, um, so some of these images are pornographic you know, in terms of the way that they are um, sense of the exposure of, of the, the, the male genitals and, and, and that experience. And so we, there's, they're overlapping ways of reading this. And it's, it's, and so today we're still grappling with this history of, of the body in many ways, but also how the archive is, has, is actually opening up a way to tell a different story not just one story, but multiple histories and at different times. And I think that that's uh, important to, to experience. Thank you. Um, we, are, we do have a couple of questions and I'd like to give the audience a chance to weigh in. I am going to stop sharing the screen. Um, so this actually, I'll start with John because John was there from the very beginning of this project. Um, how did the project begin? How does a group of scholars from different backgrounds converge on one set of photographs? So uh, Lisa, I mean, it, it really begins with you, Lisa, approached <laughs> me many years ago about doing a, a Radcliffe Institute um, workshop, essentially. It's a, a forum in which Radcliffe will allow, allowed us to bring together um, scholars from all over to discuss these uh, daguerreotypes from multiple perspectives. Uh, and Lisa, you were interested in because you, it's in the Peabody, they were in the Peabody, there was 
uh, there was some good scholarship on it, but mostly from art historians. And yet there's a lot of questions outside of art history. And as Deb pointed out, the how we understand and interpret the past has absolutely crucial influence and implications for how we understand the present and how we think about the future. I mean, I tell my students um, all the time, I quote Orwell's 1984, a totalitarian novel in which um, the, the party says, who controls the past controls the future, who controls the future controls the present. And so this was a way of trying to obtain a broader understanding. And we actually had two of these seminars and they were, I thought, very successful that Lisa, you kind of launched and spearheaded. And that really led to the book because of the enthusiasm by scholars from all different fields. Um, so in some cases, scholars who hadn't had that much exposure or experience or um, background in photography, but understood the crucial implication of trying to do some sort of justice to uh, the past and connecting it to the present. Yeah. So this, that's, so I'm going to give John more credit that, that really um, the project would not have gotten off the ground without um, John's being engaged with it. And so together he and I put, um, invited um, 15 to 20 scholars to a Radcliffe Exploratory Seminar in 2012, where we all spent a weekend together um, and, and talked about the daguerreotypes. What do we do about these daguerreotypes? If you could write about these daguerreotypes, what do they tell us? And everyone started by reading Molly Rogers's wonderful book, Delia's Tears, beforehand. And Molly had done incredible research. So we, we all tried to feel, figure out, well, how do we build on this? Right. And then by 2015, Sarah had come to Harvard um, and was invited into the group. Some people had dropped out and people started writing, writing their articles. And, and really we had an archivist, we had uh, anthropologists, we had people from English literature, history, right. photography, art history, um, a whole mixture of people. And then we have a question here um, from someone about why at the end did we include the stories, the voices of students and young researchers in the volume alongside the essays of established scholars and professors. And I, I will say something and then I want to ask Sarah something. Um, to me, um, having been at the Peabody, seeing young people come in through courses taught by Sarah and um, Robin Bernstein, who is also one of the contributors to the book. Um, I, I'm, it's a very hard experience. I watched these students go through a kind of um, transition and, and Sarah, I know, can speak more to that. Um, and so Robin had a class in the Peabody archives. She had about 10 students and um, they, we did, she decided to ask them if they wanted to give a written response to the daguerreotypes and their responses were so honest mm -hmm. and free about their feelings about the daguerreotypes. We, who spent years honing our articles, put them in a special place where we can actually try to cope with the emotional impact. And I personally, of looking at these images, and I try to subdue that to the best of my ability, but these students did not, and they were completely honest. And so I have wanted to ask Sarah, what? What has it been like teaching with these images? It must be really hard. Um, well, I first want to thank also the students that I know are in the audience, actually. I mentioned to me that they're coming um, because of precisely what you're speaking to, Lisa. I, I want to thank the students for their trust in me as a professor in uh, introducing these objects to them. I, 
every year and now I guess I've taken approximately maybe 250 students through. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, to see these objects. Every year I debate whether I, whether I will introduce these objects to the students, um, in part because, and I really can't speak here to the degree of preparation that's required on my part to, to prepare the students for this experience, whether I have uh, the emotional fortitude to witness that transformation every, with every single person um, that semester. What's taking place for the students is not just a, an intellectual shift, uh, an ability to hone critical thinking skills. They're leaving oftentimes with their principles and even ethics, if not clarified, but redefined. Uh, I think what emerges, and I, I really respect the kind of privacy of the classroom, so I'd never reveal the questions that they ask, but the, the themes really hover around justice. How can they as students and how can we as a society um, better uh, create a, a community in which this would never take place in its say you know contemporary kind of analogy and so to answer your question Lisa it's, it's certainly profound um, and it's it's maybe the, it's an extraordinary privilege to be able to consider through that experience how we can best honor the sitters' uh, lives robbed of their own agency in that moment of the creation of the photograph through how it is that we speak about the objects, through how it is that I teach the objects. And I, and I will say this, even though it's maybe one day that you and I at least are together in the, the Peabody with the students, that, that day lasts for the entire semester and beyond and is the moment that the course often is building towards, whether it's Vision and Justice, Humanities 20, this new course, or American Racial Ground. Um, I often say that the class really can't begin until they actually see those objects. Even when I show them briefly on the screen, say JPEGs, it it's just simply does not compare to the actual experience. And of course, there, there are tears oftentimes. Um, there, there's the kind of silence that speaks to just pregnant possibility in the mind's eye. You can see the questions, the, the uh, disbelief on the part uh, of the students looking at these objects and knowing that Harvard students 150 years prior did as well and that they are in lineage and how now have responsibility to think through how they're going to do what many of us don't have the opportunity to, which is to have your lives shifted um, productively, positively because of what you've seen. So it's, um, and Robin Bernstein's essay and the students such as Will Pruitt, who is a, a TF of mine in Vision and Justice, in, who has a piece in the essay, uh, just speaks so powerfully to the transformation that I, I witnessed time and time again in the students and teaching these objects. Yeah, and I, 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 I have been told a couple of times by students that who, who've questioned why, why we show these images. And I'm, I wonder, and I believe we should. Mm -hmm. I wonder if any of you want to speak about why it is important to see these, even if it can, can be traumatic. Well, we, we only have, what, two minutes left. We only have two minutes left. So it, it's a long story. Um, you know, I also teach, you know, I taught the book. There's 80, 85, 95 students in the class. Um, most of the students had not experienced these images. They said that they never even had a class on slavery. These are um, first and second year college students. So they had not they didn't know the history. They couldn't even imagine the history. Um, they said that they, some people were from Europe, said that they didn't have this type of racism in, in, um, in Europe. And, and then one of the students wrote a paper and realized that where Agassiz was born, you know? And so, so it just opened up a whole new history for them, a whole new understanding of humanity for them and understanding how to use the archive to move forward with the future. And I think it's really important for um, as a research um, tool to, to look at photographs, but also for it's important for students to understand the histories and, and they can't talk about it they, if they don't know it happened. 
but they can't empathize if they don't know what happened. And that's what's important about it. I do just want to add one thing briefly. I, I agree with everything that we've all said and what Deb just said. I do think it's impossible to grasp the nature of how slavery structured sight and regard and citizenship in this country in democracy without understanding these objects and the events that could have produced these objects. I don't think there's anything that can replace that. Um, but I think that it's important to teach these objects especially today, because we have these near daily reminders of just the fragility of rights in this country, not just being secured by laws and norms, but by culture. And we're living in this moment where the failure to really see one another is having these fatal consequences. And so these objects, I think, speak to the origins of this long journey that we're all part of today. I would just like to add briefly that just to, those are wonderful comments is that um, whites, white men in particular, had gained control of the humanities for most of the 20th century in history and English and art history. Slavery was completely sanitized for most of the 20th century. If you read a, a history, it was by a white man typically, and slavery was seen as benevolent or at least even into the 1980s, partly benevolent. Uh, images and uh, the voices of enslaved people or of African Americans were essentially excluded. You could read a 500 page book and never uh, be introduced to a non-white person. And that was true throughout the humanities and, and their private letters, essentially these, there was a disproportionate number of leaders within the academy who were themselves Southerners and it was a way of trying to redeem uh, themselves after redeem the South after the Civil War. They were they were they were open and explicit about that in their correspondence. And so all the more reason to um, essentially introduce students whose parents and grandparents had did not have were not able to be exposed to it to confront the past in a much more authentic and realistic and accurate way and to encourage um, properly contextualize their interpretations. And that can be very, that can be very emotionally disturbing. I'm, I'm gonna let you, you all, it was so wonderful to spend this time with you all. Um, and I'll just spin off from what John just said is that actually that's kind of what this book is trying to do. You know, you take it home, you look at it and you have to confront the images you get your you can do it in your own time but they're there for for you to to reckon with mm -hmm. and i think that's exceedingly important but i also think we need to remind that um the images by um evelyn and oh. her chapter higginbotham yeah. professor the family images of, yeah. of of free blacks at that same time right. and black photographers who photographed black families at that time so we're, it's, it's important to acknowledge her, her essay is central yeah. as well. That, that, is, that is true. And, and there are a number of other essays that touch on important subjects that we didn't get to, mm -hmm. but Evelyn um, Higginbotham traces her family history through images right back to slavery, including a photograph of her enslaved great aunt um, Margaret Ann, and that is paired with, and her tragic story, and that is paired with um, an article, an essay by Matthew Fox Amato, who talk about enslaved people's own uses of photography, and that's very new research, and it's something, you know, John worked with Matthew uh, at, at one point, but it's a kind of research none of us really knew much about. So that there's that's why our students are important. That's why, <laughs> and they're absolutely. And yeah. and the thing is, is that what what those two articles do is they also talk about the empowerment of photography right. and their counterpoints to the kind of exploitation that appeared in Gdili's photography. Yes. So it's very and Carrie's work is about the empowerment of photography. Yes. 
And we also have an item, can't believe we haven't actually, because John Stoffer's here, spoken about the context of understanding this moment as one in which Frederick Douglass was beginning to articulate. The, Douglas of a dog was the so, most famous, the so most that, photographed American. I mean, <laughs> I mean Matthew, Matthew Fox and Mono really highlights, I mean, it was, I mean, I and others have pointed out the way in which um, black abolitionists um, really, they, they led the way in using photography both as an aesthetic and political tool. And um, I, I say in the picturing Frederick Douglass that the best we know, African Americans in the North and black abolitionists in general, they sat for their photographs more than other groups. And um, then we found out that Douglass was the most photographed American in the 19th century, which is really, I think significant because here's this former slave who is more photographed than Lincoln, than Grant, than some, than any other major figure. And we know from David Blight's book that uh, David Blight argues that more people came to hear Douglas speak during the golden age of oratory than any other figure, white or black, with the possible exception of Mark Twain. Wow. I mean, he, Douglas was truly one of the literally two or three most significant figures in um, uh, the United States during his lifetime. Mm -hmm. In a way, again, that for a good part of the 20th century, that significance, that history was erased mm -hmm. and it was done politically by whites. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so <laughs> I... <laughs> I think Harvard Book Harvard Bookstore is going to pull God. our chairs out from under us and kick us off. <laughs> but I can't think of a better way to end this than to to talk about Frederick Douglass and and the strength that that he he has offered us. Um, and and here we go with the Harvard Bookstore. Thank you all. It was so nice. This was kind of a reunion yes, uh, of wonderful. our collaboration. Thank you. Wonderful to see you, Deborah and you Sarah too. and Lisa. It's, it's uh, Zoom is can be very alienating, and it's just a, a real treat for me to be able to, if only virtually, to yeah. spend some time with you. Uh, likewise, always a pleasure. Thank you. Well, this has been a truly amazing event, and I am so honored to have been able to participate in it, at least as a host, um, and I'm so glad that the audience was able to witness this as well. I just want to take a moment to thank our wonderful speakers again, and all of you for spending your evening with us and showing up for authors, publishers, indie bookselling, and our incredible staff here at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support. Now and always, please make sure to check out the book at the link below. Thanks again for your time and your support and for spending a part of your Friday evening with us. Have a great night, everyone, and stay well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.